Awesome. <clears throat> now we're going to start off with Mark in a second. Um, but everybody, please turn off your mics for now. We'll let the speakers do their presentations and then we'll do questions after each speaker. Um, just want, I want to avoid the extraneous dogs and cats and construction noise. Uh, we are recording today, so if you have an aversion to being recorded, just don't talk. Um, other than that, it should be an interesting afternoon. And Flynn, we're going to get going with you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for dropping in. It's so great to see um, so many uh, familiar people and new people, too. And thanks to Michael for hosting. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this book that I just made that's um, hot off the press. And actually I have, it's still not totally done, but I have one advanced copy that arrived today. So it's excellent timing. Um, this is this book, it's um, Cosmic Dance. Um, I'll just talk for a minute about uh, how I started kind of working on this. A few years ago, I started photographing dust. Um, just around our house. And at that time, oh wait, is that someone talking to me or no? Okay. No, um, that needs to turn somebody, okay. Um, so at the time when I had the idea to start photographing dust, my daughter was really young and still taking naps. And I would like lie down with her, try to get her to nap. And I would always notice how much dust, like the layers of it were like in the windowsill and, uh, you know, it was just a constant sort of presence, you know, if anybody, I mean, for probably many of us, especially if you have uh, young kids or live in an old dusty house, it's just uh, a constant feature is uh, the housework and um, dust everywhere. And so one day I just had this idea to, you know, it, and I noticed that some of like there's some hair and it's a clump of dust in the windowsill that actually was quite beautiful, how the sun came through and was reflecting on this hair. And, and I thought, could I, could I make this a subject? Could I sort of turn this nothingness into something. And so when I kind of got around to trying it, um, trying my experiment, it, it was remarkably beautiful. And I felt like it was almost sort of transcendent how it, um, how it, how it came through. And the sense of like vastness of these tiny particles was, was really compelling. So anyway, cut to um, now I've been compiling uh, you know, the images into a book form. And so that's, um, that's where I'm at. I'll just, I'll share my screen and go through a few images from the book and then I guess open up for questions um, at that point. So stand by, let's see. Okay, Cosmic Dance. Now this poem, um, I had, uh, you know, the podcast on being, I don't know if anybody listens to that. It's a really great podcast um, uh, with Krista Tippett and she had this poet Marilyn Nelson on the show and she, um, she read this poem called Dusting and it was just completely perfect for, for me. I was putting this work together as a book. And so I, I, I wrote to Marilyn Nelson and she said I could use her poem uh, in my book. So it was a real honor for her to let me do that. It's a beautiful poem and it, it couldn't be more apt as an introduction. Gray hairs from my brush. Dust to dust, Sally the white cat before and after. Remains of the flannel duvet cover from the lens screen. Dust, hair, pine needles, end of January. Galloping wave of dust, human DNA, and foam insulation. Void. After brushing our cat, late spring. Jumping thing, string and particle leap off the lint screen. This one always kind of reminds me of like string theory. When I, when I hear string theory, I of course picture strings. 
and multi, you know, multiple dimensions and strings jumping around. So this always kind of in my mind alludes to, to something like that, the layperson's understanding of what that might be. Feather mammoth, bedroom floor, morning, March 16th. Dust puppy, bottom of the stairs. This is a whole universe that uh, exists. We don't, you, you don't even notice it, but it's a vast universe, like right in our midst. It's so neat. What emerged from the dark matter under my daughter's bed? Where did she go? From my mother's brush after her death, end of the summer. And, and that's, that's what I have from the book to share with you today. Um, I'll just go ahead and open up for questions, you know, so um, I can keep the screen share up. Maybe would that be good? Just so we can go back and look at different spreads. Um, anyone have any thoughts or anything they want to? How did yeah. you, what did you do for lighting? Oh, um, some of these are just natural light, window light. I have a black, um, you know, duvetine thing uh, that I'm shooting them against. So sometimes I'll use a little, a little uh, flash, a little speed light. These are digital images. Um, but the, the black background really, it just, it makes it really feel sort of expansive and vast. Like you're looking at outer space, which is, which I just really love. Lynn, can you say a little bit about, about why you chose to handwrite the, yeah. the captions? Yeah, thanks, Buzz. Um, it kind of came about a bit naturally. Like at first, I, you know, I've been doing this for like years, just kind of pecking away at it and making new images, um, almost, almost as a meditation, kind of like just to sit and, and do a few and then reflect on them. Um, and the handwriting came about really just initially as a way for me to just make notes for myself about what the different you know, bits were from. And so um, I think it was actually at one of the fixed meetings, Buzz and I are in a, a group, a photography group together um, about a year and a half ago. And I had these uh, test prints and on the back of them, I had written what the, what, you know, what the dust particle was from. And I, I started to realize that the handwriting um, was kind of like a really beautiful component to the images. And then especially as I put the book together and started laying it out, it just seemed like the way to go. It, it reminded me of a scrapbook or a field guide or not a field guide, but like a field notebook kind of thing. Um, rather than having a printed caption. Um, and then just the, the way that the captions uh, work to, to ground the image in this very specific um, moment and, and uh, it seems like a, a counter, a counterweight to the sort of like ethereal nature of the image. Um, does that seem so? That's yeah. I think that's my answer pretty much. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you like to read some of the lines from the poem that are particularly? Oh, I could just. I'll just read the poem. Um, oh, great. Good. Yeah, Marilyn Nelson is such a, a wonderful poet. Thank you for these tiny particles of ocean salt, pearl necklace viruses, winged protozoans, for the infinite intricate shapes of sub-microscopic sub living things, for algae spores and fungus spores bonded by vital mutual genetic cooperation, spreading their inseparable lives from equator to pole. My hand, my arm makes sweeping circles, dust climbs the ladder of light, for this infernal endless chore, for these eternal seeds of rain. Thank you for dust. I love that. That's yeah, it's perfect. I mean, the infernal endless chore uh, really uh, says it all too. And, um, you know, especially, you know, as like a mom and at home and sort of like focusing on the domestic sphere, you know, I was trying to find a way to have a creative outlet and maybe some kind of beautiful transcendence, like within just the day to day looking around at the most mundane little bits and particles. So the infernal endless chore is, uh, you know, big part of, um, part of it, I guess. Um, was it germs of rain? Um, what is it? Uh, seeds of rain. Seeds of rain. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Because clouds need dust to, uh, yeah. to do their thing. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Lovely um, poem. 
yeah yeah just beautiful poem and i'm happy that uh that she let me let me use it yeah um, did, did you ever think that if you were a clean freak you would never have made this book <laughs> um you know i never did think about that but that's a really good point i'll have to uh <laughs> <laughs> I'll def definitely never dust again. <laughs> um, no, there's no lack of material. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think it also kind of gets to the idea of like, you know, traditionally women's work and using these materials for a subject that are, you know, traditionally sort of mundane and overlooked like lint and, you know, just hairs and things around the house. And um, so, uh, you know, as a, woman artist it's it's uh it really resonates with with me and hopefully viewers as well um just the choice of of materials you know do you do you keep your subjects do you have a whole collection of dust and lint no, I, not really for sometimes i will keep i i did a little bit here and there but i just think they, they just get all smushed and then i don't know where you know i it's just it's too hard to keep track of them all um but sometimes I'll find something that I really want to photograph, but I don't have the time to do it. So I'll just keep it in a little jar or a, a bag and uh, set it on the bookcase for when I have a moment. So there have been times when it's been covered with little jars and, and bags of various random things that, um, you know, my family thinks is kind of funny. So. Can I ask a question? Please? Of course. Yes, please. Um, the photographs are really beautiful. Um, yeah, just um, I just thinking about like there's on a certain level, maybe not a lightheartedness to um, the the work, but sort of maybe casual aspect to it. But in many ways, I feel like it's sort of just a kind of gloss over maybe um, you know the idea of ruin <laughs> and grief. Um, yeah. I think there's grief in here for sure. Um, and I don't want to, you know, ask you a personal question, but I'm just asking. I just want to know, like, how you negotiate the kind of, you know, separation between that sort of accessibility and um, and then what might be some darker underlying, you know, sort of um, threads. Yeah. No. Thank you for the question. That's um, it's great to have questions that kind of remind you and push you to. Yes, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, as I as it kind of went along taking these photos, I would look back at them and kind of realize what some of them may have been about. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's definitely, this spans like a few years of our life. I mean, um, it's, it, I, I would, you know, dip in every now and then I'd try to make more dust photos. And, and so it, it does, there were like, you know, pets that we lost, my mother died, um, you know, things like that, that are definitely there. Um, and maybe the lightheartedness is a way of um, just kind of putting one foot in front of the other or keeping the dance going. I mean, I, I called it cosmic dance partly because as I would scroll through the images in Lightroom, trying to pick out the ones, um, they come to life in this really remarkable way. Um, and, in fact, I sort of envision this also as, as like with movement as almost a slideshow. Um, and I just started to feel like it was part of like just the keeping moving and also physically moving. And I love moving myself. I'm a semi sort of dancer. And, um, and so I don't know if I'm getting at your question at all, but um, sure. I, I appreciate your question. It's absolutely true. Um, it's, it's a bit of a Rorschach thing, sort of looking at these, some of them, and just feeling like uh, they were about things that I didn't even realize they were about, certain losses mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, my hope is that, yeah. To me, there's a, they, it's a reminder of mortality, mm -hmm. you know, and how transitory life is. And, um, you know, even though these are objects, they'll never be probably resting in exactly the same shape again. You know, mm -hmm. because they're 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 fragile. Mm -hmm. It's not like they exactly have a life of their own, but they probably can settle and change shape. And mm -hmm. but yeah, it's it's um it's kind of sober. <laughs> so <Sorry. Right. laughs> yeah, no, it really is. It's true. I mean, I guess it's a reminder of just how ephemeral life is in a certain way. I mean. I, I do look at it sort of as a celebration of, of giving meaning to something that is really meaningless, like 
particles of dust from our house, the most overlooked, irritating nuisance, we can imbue it with meaning and significance. And, and we do, and it's the human instinct to do that and meditate on it and find the beauty in it um, along with the darkness that I think is what compels me to kind of keep working on this. I'll probably always keep photographing these, you know, bits. Um, and my, my hope is that, you know, viewers will, you know, be able to kind of meditate on, on the images in a way and, and kind of reflect on, you know, the, the time of year and just the things that are in the image. And I think hopefully there's some universality there that um, is, you know, useful. Do you think we could look at the uh, dust puppy again? Oh, sure. There's so many. Um, and and next to it, the, uh, the mammoth. I, Seems like there are a lot of ways of looking at that dust puppy. I mean, I, I, I see it one way. Uh -huh. <laughs> does, does it play visual tricks on other people? Hmm. I, I see the head on the left and up upright. Uh -huh. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But. Yeah, some of them could go more than one way. Yeah. Um, these two seem like they're having a face off of some sort or <laughs> um, or I just like thinking about these sort of beings that um, are created out of nothingness that are in our midst that um, seem to have a personality of their own somehow um, that are not really real creatures I guess but but I've been thinking about this Picasso quote that I saw recently that anything you can imagine is real. Ah. I like thinking about that because I think that's true too, because I think the sort of interior life is actually no different from your from the exterior world in a certain way. And your, your imaginative life is just as real as any exterior, you know, sort of stimulus that we perceive in our senses. So I, I like, making these creatures come to life. I do, I do a, some amount of kind of sculpting of the, you know, bits and pieces so that they look how I want them to look. Um, I, I enjoy how it feels like you've captured some new form of primordial life that it's to me, it's like you went to Antarctica and you found this cave and all these beings, you know, were in the <laughs> cave and you've, you know, photographed them for the first time. Right, right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love that idea too. And also just that it's, it's all right here. It's like right in our midst, we're like breathing it in. And mm -hmm. um, there is this parallel universe or universes that are around us all the time that we don't see. And, uh, but, but they're there, you have to like open up a little portal in your brain to kind of allow it in. Um, so thank you. I recall during uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos days, him making the observation that approximately 11 tons of dust falls on the surface of the earth every day from outer space. Oh my goodness, uh, that is remarkable. Cool. That's Linus, Michael. Yeah. Um, did you work with the publisher on this? Oh yeah, uh, no, I did not. Um, thanks for asking. I. I did not, I did self-published um, and I'm only making 50 copies. Uh, it was, the actual printing process was more complicated than I, than I thought it was gonna be, um, you know, I guess not having a ton of experience working directly with a, a printer. I used Conveyor, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Conveyor, the um, uh, printing studio. Um, so I made 50 copies and I, it's, it's self-published. Yeah, originally I was hoping it would be a soft cover and then I would make more and then they couldn't make the cover look good with that paper stock. So it was a lot of back and forth and, and stuff like that. And I guess this is technically an oversized book. It's 12 inches long landscape. So um, now I know that's sort of considered oversized and it's a lot harder to make it work out quite exactly how you want. Um, but it's, it's good. I'm happy with it. Did they have a designer you worked with or is it all yours? Well, I worked with a designer, somebody who I've worked with, with before. Um, 
William Van Roden, who uh, is great. Yeah, we've worked together before and he helped me just with all of the nuts and bolts of InDesign and everything like that, mm -hmm. and fonts and everything. Do you have an expected date of availability? I mean, uh, imminently. I have this advanced copy and I think that starting this week, um, they will be available. And uh, I'll, I'll send you, I guess, a link um, to where I'm also on Instagram. I guess I'm gonna, I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna sell them. There's only 50 copies, so, um, but uh, yeah, I'll sell them starting very soon. I'll be sure to let you know as soon as they're in my hand. And I'll be signed and numbered as well, so. Um, okay, well, I'll so. add that link into the, the book talk. Great, yeah, yeah, for sure, for Archive, sure. So people can link to you. Yeah, great, yeah. great, thank you. Does anybody else have anything for Flynn? Yeah. I appreciate that the design didn't take away from the photographs. It accentuated the photographs and you don't always see that. So oh yeah, cool, thank you. Really nice. Yeah, I kind of went into it like knowing exactly what I wanted and I, I, I just needed help with the fonts and kind of with using InDesign and getting the files to the, to the printer. And I knew that I wanted to keep it just simple and straightforward. And so, yeah, I, um, I went into it with pretty, with clarity on that. So thank you. Oh, thanks all. Thanks, Lynn. Very nice. Uh, Mark, we'll kick it over to you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks to Michael. Um, it's great to uh, be here with your crowd. And um, thanks for sponsoring this, making it happen. Thanks to Bill for facilitating all the Zoom details. And uh, great to share the bill with Flynn. Um, so um, yeah, I'm gonna show you some slides and talk about uh, St. Lucie books a little bit and then talk about the actual book, um, Running, Falling, Flying, Floating, Crawling. Um, I just call it RFFFFC <laughs> uh, to myself. So uh, let me share the screen here. Um, um, let's see. <clears throat> I don't see, oh. Am I, um, I don't see, uh, do you see my screen? No, not yet. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this is the most recent book from St. Lucie Books, Running, Falling, Flying, Floating, Crawling, and I'll talk about that in one second. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the origin of St. Lucy Books. Um, I've been running, I've been a, an artist, writer, photographer um, for a long time. Um, writing has always been a really important component of my, my personal life and my professional life, as well as exhibiting works and doing performances and that sort of thing. Um, and about 10 years ago, um, I started St. Lucy website as a place to archive um, you know, a lot of my um, articles uh, that were appeared in obscure journals and that sort of thing, but also as an excuse to write things that um, I wanted to write that I wasn't finding an outlet for. And it turned into a kind of 10 year project uh, that um, has conversations, you know, wide ranging conversations with artists and photographers and curators and writers, et cetera, um, and a variety of other kinds of um, features, including essays and, and portfolios. So I was working on that for, uh, t you know, it's, it'll be 10 years this year, actually, right around now. I started it in 2011. Um, and um, so St. Lucie Books um, became, is a kind of uh, an extension of the mission of the, of the St. Lucie website. Um, so as I, this is my little blurb here. St. Lucie Books publishes elegant, idiosyncratic, and accessible books that combine words and images to celebrate contemporary photographic artists and to explore the marginal, hidden, and parallel histories of photography. I know that covers a lot. <laughs> um, so I want to say that, so I, in 2016 or so, I was, um, I just completed this book, um, which is a, a series of uh, connected essays about my relationship to photography from my parents' uh, wedding album to, you know, my own interest in my own photographs and um, photographs that I've been moved by or um, in some ways engaged with over the years. And I was shopping this book around um, to the usual suspects and 
many were interested, but none could really um, sort of figure out how to market it. They said, well, it's not theory, it's not photographic history, it's not a monograph, it's not a, um, um, it's not a memoir, it's all of those things. And um, so um, it was, it was, I was having difficulty placing it. So around that same, so I'll just show you, this is just some um, chapters or essays from the book. The wedding album starts with my, an essay about my uh, obsession, my childhood obsession with my parents' wedding album. Um, I talk about some photographs I've made. This is an essay about Larry Sultan, who was my teacher, and then my friend, um, it's sort of an homage to him. And around that same time, uh, I was shopping my book around and having some trouble. Um, I started talking a conversation with Laura Larson, um, who was, I knew was shopping her book, Hidden Mother, around. And I asked her, so who's going to publish your book? And she said, I can't find anyone. They, it's theory, it's, it's, it's photographic history, it's memoir, it's none of the above, it's all the above. And um, it suddenly occurred to me that, um, well, maybe I should publish it. <laughs> maybe um, St. Lucie should be publishing books. Um, to um, create a kind of niche uh, or sort of explore an area where words and images combine um, in sort of equal fashion. Um, and um, anyway, so these sort of hybrid kinds of, um, uh, of books. So that's sort of how it started. And so um, I decided in 2017, well, actually late 2016 to publish, start publishing books. And so I published my own book and then published Laura Larson's Hidden Mother, which is a beautiful, um, you know, um, kind of episodic, lyrical investigation of what it means to be a mother using these um, uh, 19th century photographs, hidden mother photographs of um, daguerreotypes and tintypes uh, of uh, mothers with their, with their faces obscured or their bodies obscured by tapestries and that sort of thing, which was a sort of standard practice in photographing children in the 19th century. So she uses it as a metaphor to explore the nature of um, motherhood and meaning and identity and longing, et cetera. Um, so once these, well, I did this book, I did my own book and I did Laura's book and then suddenly I've seen, oh, this is doable. So after that, I published um, uh, this book called uh, Conversations with St. Lucy, which is long ranging, uh, wide ranging um, interviews with uh, Eleanor Carucci, Doug Dubois, Ronnie Matar, um, Ron Jude and um, Sarah Blesner. Then in 2018, I worked with Oliver Wasau uh, to uh, publish Friends, Enemies, and Strangers, which to me was like, for me, is like the book of the Trump era. Um, and uh, Oliver, I knew his work uh, uh, for a long time. He's sort of a master of photo manipulation. And um, he was making these photographs of um, using found photographs of uh, people that we know, political people, uh, photographs of, you know, uh, sort of vernacular photographs, snapshots and photo booth pictures, and then making these really beautiful photographs of people that he knew and loved, his friends and family. And he combined them in this really interesting way. Um, so it becomes this sort of, um, you know, um, portrait gallery of the era of uh, people that we, that are friends, enemies and strangers. Um, and uh, he makes no distinction. I think that you could flip through the book and might, you might sort of guess who's friends and enemies and strangers. But anyway, it's a sent all of these faces. Um, and um, it's really a, quite a beautiful, I think, beautiful book. <clears throat> um, so just to give you a little heads up. So um, I'm publishing two books this year, uh, Bree Souders, uh, 11 Years, which is coming out in uh, early June. Um, and it's the first monograph of this Brooklyn-based uh, photographic artist. I'm really super excited about it. Um, uh, I also wanna say that uh, four of the five books uh, from St. Lucie Books are uh, designed by Gannett Abraham, who's my colleague at the University of Maryland. And we have this really great working relationship. And she worked for Random House and Norton for many years. And she knows the ins and outs of books and is just an extraordinary designer. Um, but every book looks different. She's very flexible and, you know, it's, you know, works, collaborates with me and the artist to try to find ways to, um, you know, to bring their sort of, their sort of vision to life. So I'm really excited about Bree's book. And then in, in the fall, in September, uh, publishing, working with um, Odette England, um, who you may know is, you know, sort of prolific and recently published her book, um, Keepers of the Hearth. 
uh, which is a you know kind of tribute or um, homage to Roland Barthes' um, uh, Camera Lucida. Anyway, so we've been working together on this um, for a few months, and it'll be coming out in September. Uh, it's this extraordinary kind of um, artist book about her experiences growing up on a dairy farm in Southern Australia. Um, it's really quite stunning. So anyway, looking forward to that happening in September as well. So you can keep an eye out for that. So let me get back to running, falling, flying, floating, crawling. Um, so just a few things, There's a lot of people involved in this project, right? There are over 80 people. Um, there is over 50 um, image makers and over 20 uh, writers. So it's a big compendium, a kind of anthology. Um, all of the images and texts um, deal with or evoke or explore the idea of the human body in relationship to these various states of abandoned helplessness, terror, subjugation, serenity, and transcendence. Now, to say a little bit about it, just that um, I was a few years ago asked to uh, curate a show at a small museum um, and uh, I came up with a number of ideas. And one of them was this idea of like using uh, photographs and videos, mostly sort of performative images um, of bodies floating and running and, and falling and that kind of thing. And, um, and I put together this um, mm -hmm. proposal and I loved it very much. Um, and for various reasons, it didn't happen. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, I, I proposed it to a couple of other institutions and it never happened for various reasons. And I just thought, well, you know, I really became, you know, uh, you know I became very single-minded about it. So um, I realized that it needed to be a book, but I needed to sort of reformulate it and reconceptualize it, you know, if it was going to work in a book form. So because the photographs, the images from the book are, you know, they're, they're vernacular photographs, there are documentary photographs, there are art photographs. Um, um, I wanted equally to have a kind of wide variety of voices um, um, contributing to the book. So there are poets and there are critics and there are art historians. Um, and so there are a variety of texts that approach um, the idea of bodies in these various states. Um, so it has a very kind of fragmented or sort of episodic quality to it. Um, so for me, it opens with these images of, um, of, of Moybridge uh, with quotes from um, some of the essays in the book from Kim Beale uh, and Diane Seuss, the amazing poet Diane Seuss. Um, if you don't know her work, you should check it out. Um, and then, um, so, yeah, I just, oh, this is a little out of order. So this is the sort of the title page um, has a, there's an image of that. I love that's a vernacular photograph from the um, Barbara Levine, Paige Ramey um, collection of vernacular photography that they just, uh, that was just acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, and I just wanna start by talking about this image. Um, as I was doing my research for the book, I was researching Andre Cortege um, there's a couple of images I wanted in, in, in to include. And on the National Gallery uh, of Art website, there was this photograph and I'd never seen this cortege photograph before. And I, the details just said gelatin silver print, whatever, 1919, whatever it is. And, um, and uh, the tiny little picture, right? Um, and uh, I looked at it, I'm like, it looks like cortege drew wings <laughs> on that figure. Um, so I, uh, contacted the National Gallery of Art. I said, it, it doesn't say anything, it just says gelatin silver print. And they looked at it, so they took it out and the, uh, the preparators, or not the preparators, but the conservators, you know, looked at it under a magnifying, I mean, under a, teles a microscope and realized that in fact, he hadn't scribed um, these wings in ink uh, on, that's his brother Gino, who he's photographed a lot in the early 20th century. Um, so this became the kind of, for me, like the sort of guardian angel, the entire project. So, um, you know, there's sometimes there is a kind of relationship between the image and the text, like Leah, the poet Leah Purpura, um, you know, chose uh, these photographs, these images of ja Baz Jan Otter of falling um, as a kind of um, jumping off point <laughs> to, to uh, make a little pun there, um, uh, to talk about the idea of falling. Um, and um, so you might know Baz Jan Otter's work and we did a whole variety of these sort of pieces in the 70s um, having to do with gravity. Here he is falling off a roof. Um, one of the early images or essays is by Kate Palmer Albers, the uh, photo historian um, who writes about uh, Harry Callahan's Eleanor photograph. 
And it sort of segues, it goes from this into photographs by Mara Biava, who's um, an Italian uh, artist, um, sort of interdisciplinary artist who also um, who lives and works in, Net in uh, Amsterdam. So these are photographs that she had made in the 90s of herself uh, floating and making, sort of exploring this idea of the sort of the mythological uh, woman's body in, in the sort of in the, in the, in the sea. So there's Aaron Siskin's, you know, Pleasures and Terrors of Levitation, um, Chris Burden crawling through glass, Jimmy DeSanta's um, photographs. So as you can see, there's this extraordinary variety of photographs. Um, there's this terrific short essay by David Levi Strauss about this uh, Susan Mizelis photograph from her um, uh, Nicaragua work, where it explores this photograph, what it came to mean in a kind of symbolic level, and then what happened to this person. Um, after the fact, um, and it's a really, really interesting story. The uh, great uh, curator, historian, you know, David Campany wrote about John DeVolo's uh, project, As Far As I Can Get. Um, Odette England uh, wrote about Larry Sultan's um, underwater swimmer photographs. Um, it was a really beautiful lyrical essay that Odette wrote. Um, there's Oliver Wassa's floating pictures. Um, there's Lily McElroy did a series of like uh, called I Throw Myself at Men, these sort of performative pieces in which she arranged on, I think, Craigslist to meet these strange men <laughs> in, in bars. And then she would literally throw herself at them. Um, and there would be, a, a, she would go with a friend who would then photograph her in midair. Um, it's a terrific kind of series of performative photographs. Um, and this is another vernacular photograph that I bought um, from eBay. This uh, series of uh, amazing uh, photographs by Gideon Mendel, a South African documentary photographer. Um, he's doing this whole series about global uh, climate change and he's uh, this, uh, uh, exploring uh, flooding and, and sea rise. Uh, he's done these portraits of people in their homes while the waters of various, you know, bodies of water are, are rising in their in their towns or cities or neighborhoods. So as you can see, these are uh, photographs from Rania, Rania Matar uh, of her sort of portraits of young women. Um, this Im image of a woman in Lebanon on the left, and uh, image of a woman I think in um, Massachusetts on the right. Uh, this is Yale Martinez, self-portrait, throwing his child in the air. So I'm just giving you a variety of like the whole sort of gamut of uh, what's going on here in this, in this compendium. Sig Harvey is the only sort of artist slash writer who did, who contributed both images and texts. And the book ends with these Raymond Meeks, uh, beautiful uh, Raymond Meeks photographs of uh, teenagers jumping into a quarry. So that's basically the uh, the book in a nutshell. And um, so, if you have any comments or questions, I'd love to I'd be happy to answer them for you. So, Mark, one of the great things about the book is uh, is uh, a dialectic that you set up as its editor. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how and when pairings of, of uh, text and image came together for you? Sure. Thanks, Buzz. Um, it's great to see you, by the way. Um, so basically, I put together a very rough PDF of what was in the book. And then I had um, a couple of dozen writers that I had contacted and was, you know, asked if they would be interested in contributing. And then I sent them the PDF and I said, you know, you can choose an image or mm -hmm. a body of work and respond to it directly, or you could just use it as a sort of jumping off point to, you know, speak about it in a more general fashion, the idea of the human body and any of these states of being. Um, I didn't give them any direction at all. I'd say, here's the uh, deadline and the, uh, the, <clears throat> the word limit, right? Um, so I, I wanted short text, so, you know, Everything is under a thousand words. Um, 
So basically that's what I did. And some people said, I, I definitely, like David Campany said, I'm writing about John Devola. That's, you know, right. and um, et cetera. And some people chose to write about uh, in a very general sense, like Leah Perper's piece is sort of inspired by Bazian Otter, but is not about it per se. And that, so I basically accepted everything that was sent to me. Um, after um, I got everything back, there were a few pieces that I, or bodies of work that I really wanted somebody to address, right? And um, so I, I approached a couple of people um, say, and said, you know, I'm doing this book. I'm sorry, this is the last minute, but um, I really admire your writing. And I really would like you to consider writing about this body of work or this image. So there's only, I think two or three people I did that with, right? And that sort of rounded, it, rounded off the book for me. But so I really left it open to chance. Um, I mean, I was very pleased by the results. Um, I love all the texts and, you know, much of it's, I mean, it all surprised me. <laughs> um, so, um, but like, for, for example, um, I really wanted somebody to write about um, Odette's, I mean, not, I mean, Larry Sultan's uh, sewer series um, and uh, no one chose it. So I asked Odette and also the Gideon Mundell. Um, I asked Jane Marshing to write about them because she, her, she, her work is interested in, well, she's very concerned about climate change. I knew that she yeah. would be able to address it very well. So that's the sort of how it, it sort of unfolded. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so, so your role in this was to curate the photographs and then um, to um, um, send out uh, to people you'd like to, um, you know, to write about them. Yeah, I mean, I'm basically the editor. I mean, right, uh, right. So I would have been the curator, but now I'm the editor. Okay. <laughs> and, and, so, if you just sent this out to people, I mean, did you ever get conflicts? Is, two people wanted to write about the same thing or did you eliminate ones that were already chosen? I eliminated ones. So in other words, if somebody got back to me right away and said, I want to write about John Devola, then it, when I sent it out to other people, I'd say, you can't write about John Devola. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Can I just re reflect for one second, Mark, in the beginning when you were talking about the images of people leaping and the, and the piece of writing about the, the still moment and just that that weightless moment. Um, mm -hmm. It reminds me of like, like the breath, you know, in, in yoga classes, it's like you inhale and then the top of the breath is, is just this weightless kind of quality. And then the bottom of the breath and then there's like a weightless quality and just like, you know, uh, this um, breathing is like a meditative kind of physical act and the quest for weightlessness through that just made me think of that as a, in a beautiful kind of way. Um, well, that, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I opened the book with that quote because, and that's a, it's an excerpt from Kim Beale's essay about Raymond Meeks, which actually closes the book. So there's a kind of like, you know, it's bracketed by Kim Beale's words and that, that sort of idea. I mean, she's a great writer and Raymond Meeks is a, you know, really wonderful photographer. And so I just love that idea of weightlessness in that moment that's sort of at the top of a tra the trajectory. It's like, you know, and the way that photography functions in that moment to kind of create the sort of, you know, the body is moved from, you know, um, a, a kind of an animated, you know, object into a sim. It, it, it is trans. It, it's transformed into the realm of the symbolic. Um, and um, anyway, and Kim Beale uh, captures that perfectly, which is why I introduced the book with that quote. Yeah. It it's beautiful. It's like we all have these bodies. We're constantly trying to uh, kind of get free of them in a certain way, but then it's impossible to. But anyway. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. I want to say hi to Seb. Any other questions? Okay, Mark. Where can we find your book? Oh, so um, the website is you know, stlucybooks.com. Um, that's one word, St. Lucy Books, S-A-I-N-T-L-U-C-Y books.com. And all the books are there, including Running, Falling, Flying, Floating, Crawling. Okay, I'll, I have links to both Mark's and Flynn's books on our website, of course. Um, and if nobody else has anything, we'll go ahead and wrap it up today. 
I, I just wanted to say one thing, and that is I'm so used to seeing monographs that this was a very nice departure from that in the sense that you're, uh, you've got a collection of images over time and around a theme. And I thought it was very, um, it was very inviting. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, Bree's book is, is a monograph, but, um, but it's the first one that I've done. Um, and, uh, you know, but her work is so, is very unusual in the sense that every project looks like it's made for, almost like made from a different artist. Um, but I, I do think that uh, that idea of um, a compendium, I was thinking about it in relationship to an exhibition, right? You could sort of dip in, dip out, move through the rooms, look at what you want to look at um, and have, you know, a variety of different experiences with it, uh, depending on how you enter the book, right? I mean, obviously you don't need to read everything. You can open it up at any given point. I mean, I think for me, there was, you know, the, one of the challenges was creating a flow, you know, so that, you know, not every body of work, not every image has a text attached to it. So it's not like image text, image text, image text, and this kind of binary. There are long passages in which the images are sequenced according to a gesture. Um, and so that the, there's a sort of idea of turning the page and there's a kind of gestural flow. Um, and then you come to a stopping point where um, you can read a short text and look at the images and that sort of thing. So that, that was, um, it was important for me to um, create, again, that sort of an experience. So I, I do think that for me, like art, you know, as a viewer of art, um, you know, I want to have an experience with the work, right? I, I, I look to art for experiences, right? To, for the artist to bring me to places I've never been before, to think about things I never thought about before, to expand my, my internal landscape, so to speak. Um, and so I'm hoping that this relationship between both the images and the texts and then the relationship between them can create those kinds of experiences for the, for the reader. And I, can I say one more thing, which is just that I love photography, okay? And I, I am and a very Catholic about it in terms of, um, I love vernacular photography, I love fashion photography, I love documentary photography, I like art photography. Um, I love the ubiquity um, and the sort of, uh, the fact that it's sort of, you know, deeply, you know, uh, inextricably bound in all aspects of our culture and our, and in our history. And, um, so I I want to I want the book to represent that. So there are these sort of you know performance photographs and documentary photographs and, and vernacular photographs, personal photographs and sort of public photographs. So um, anyway, let's, I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you both, Mark and Flynn. Yeah, um, thank you. Next month we have Bryce Lankard and his uh, Dead Reckoning. And this one will make you feel good, Mark. Andrew Filer with A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 schools that changed America. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so both of these guys are kind of in the neighborhood. Uh, Bryce is out of Durham, and Andrew is in Atlanta. So it's going kind to of be a Southern theme next month. Um, so thanks fantastic. everybody for coming and we'll see you then. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank thanks you. Bye. 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 Bye bye all. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everyone. Take care all. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for presenting everybody.